Right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the Sierra Nevada Alliance monthly webinar. Today, we are having a presentation from Beth Pratt uh, featuring Heike. Before we get started, I'd just like to introduce Beth Pratt for those of you who may not know her. I can find my information. Uh, she is a, lot, a lifelong advocate for wildlife. She's worked in environmental leadership roles for over 25 years in two of the country's largest national parks, Yosemite and Yellowstone. Oh, what sewing machine. Oh, it's a singer. I'm going to go ahead and mute people who are. And I Can everybody mute themselves? Sorry, there's a lot of background noise. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, where was I? Um, Beth Pratt is the California Regional Executive Director for the National Wildlife Federation and leads the Save LA Cougars campaign to build the largest wildlife crossing in the world in the Los Angeles area to help save a population of mountain lions from extin extinction. Her new book, I Heart Wildlife, a guided activity journal for connecting with the wild world, was released in August, and she is also the author of When Mountain Lions Are Neighbors, People and Wildlife Working It Out in California, published by Kate Abrams. Beth spends much of her time in LA, but makes her home outside of Yosemite, her North Star, with her five dogs, one cat, and the mountain lions, bears, foxes, and other wildlife that frequent her backyard. And it's also, we are proud to say, one of the Sierra Nevada Alliance board members. Thank you so much for joining us today, Beth. Do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks for having us, Alexis. And hey, if everybody could mute, there's still a lot of, of, of noise in the background of people talking and stuff. So I just want to make sure everybody has a good experience. Uh, if you want to mute, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end. Um, it, it, it indicates it's someone by the name of Joy Waite. Yeah. Did it go away? Okay, I think we got everybody. Um, not that I don't, you know, I, I like hearing uh, folks, but just it's hard for everybody to. <laughs> so yeah, we'll have, I'll definitely leave a lot of times for questions at the end. Thanks for having me. Uh, I love giving this talk because really what this is about is showing in, uh, photos of the cutest animal in the world, which is the pika. Uh, I just can't imagine another, you know, <laughs> another animal being this cute, although at the National Wildlife Federation, uh, which is my job, I'm the regional executive director for California. Uh, we do have some debates over the cutest animal in the world, um, but I obviously vote for pika. But as Alexis referred to, I sort of have two lives and I've worked in national parks most of my career. I live right outside Yosemite National Park on the Southwest border in a little town called Mid Pines, you might've heard of, population 400. And I worked in the park for a decade. I've worked in Yellowstone, but you know, the Sierra for me in Yosemite is home. It's my North Star and I just can't imagine being anywhere else. Uh, however, uh, my day job is actually takes me to LA a lot, actually weekly. It's kind of a second home at least it did before the pandemic. And uh, what I spend a, uh, a lot of time doing, oh, and here's the two books that Alexis referenced um, that I've written, um, is working on mountain lion conservation in Los Angeles, which seems like the most improbable places for that. But this is P22, a very famous mountain lion in Los Angeles. And um, I work there with the state and private uh, philanthropists and, and a whole bunch of partners. And this is uh, me giving Governor Newsom a tour of the site where we're building the largest wildlife crossing in the world so that these mountain lions don't go extinct. And here is a, uh, a, a visualization of what this will look like. And I've been working on this for almost 10 years now, and we will be breaking ground in November, it looks like. So if I stay on track with with fundraising, but uh, it's it's been an amazing project to work on. And again, so different than my life up here, which is what, you know, when I'm not in LA, this is what you'll see me uh, doing, which is roaming uh, nature, roaming the wilderness, most preferably the Yosemite high country. I am most happy when I am above tree line, but of course I'm here, that's, that's not possible given Toga Pass is closed, but this is me pica watching. Um, 
And what I want to do is sort of set the stage for you. I think most of you on this call are familiar with the Sierra, but this is Pika land, right? Pikas are, uh, you know, I'll get into a lot around their natural history and biology, but they are high elevation dwellers, except for a few exceptions, one being the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon. There's a population living, you know, almost at sea level. Um, but for the most part in the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada, they are high elevation dwellers. So no hardship to go pica watching. Uh, these are the landscapes that I get to roam in. And one of the, the sites I am at and one of the upsides of the pandemic, there's not too many was I didn't have to travel at all. So I could actually survey my pica sites actually two and three times a week, which was really nice. Even weekly, sometimes I couldn't get to them uh, when I was traveling a lot. And the most common one I'm at weekly is Gala Lakes Basin, which is right at Toga Pass. And this is a view of the basin from the top. Uh, if those of you familiar with it, those are as granite lakes uh, to the right. And you can just see off to the left, uh, that is the sort of, I call it mid Gaylor Lake, but the main Gaylor Lake. Um, here it is, the, uh, the, the Gaylor Lake, there's a lower, upper, and middle, uh, and I just call the middle Gaylor Lake. You can see I love uh, Gaylor Lake because it's the, the biggest, the best infinity pool in the world. You can see that's the Cathedral Range in the background. You can actually see to the far right or sort of not far, furthest, but Mount Hoffman is sort of uh, to the sort of one, two, three, three peaks from the left of the right. You got uh, Cathedral Peak there. Um, and it's just an incredible sight to go pica watching. Here's a little video of what I call Pika Hill. Um, you know, these guys know how to pick some, some scenic real estate. That's all I got to say. But this is very typical of where you'll find pica. They like talus fields like this. They boulders can't be either too big or too small, right? It's because they they live in and survive uh, by running over or under the rocks and tunnels for protections for predators. Um, and this is also a pica site. This is a little higher in elevation. The one I just showed you is about 10,000 feet. This one is about at 11.2. Um, this is another site I survey. It's also, I'll get into a great butterfly site and uh, it's just incredible. Again, these landscapes are just incredible. And I love that this little critter survives at these high elevations, which I'll get into. Um, this is just a photo of what it looks like in spring. Obviously we're far from that. And what I love, if you don't follow their Yosemite winter rangers are incredible. They've been up there for years now and they give weekly dispatches with Yosemite National Park posts. Now I am not a big skier, or at least that type of skiing. So I have not been up there in the winter, um, but they posted a, fo a photo of one of the pika sites I surveyed that I just showed you. And so it was really cool to see what it looks like in winter. Uh, and that was just taken. Um, when I'm pika watching though, and I, you know, I love all wildlife, but you know, part of pika watching is you have to be still, right? You have to be very patient if you want to see pika. You have to sit still and be there for a long time. And I have to say in my 20s and 30s, that was not as appealing to me. I always wanted to peak bag, but I'm 52 now. And I actually <laughs> really like just sort of sitting still and or walking slowly and watching what comes around. But when you're sitting on Pika Hill for hours, you get to see a lot of wildlife in the high country, which I think a lot of you will recognize. I love Clark's Nutcrackers. They're one of my favorite birds. Uh, Great crown, rosy finches, uh, mountain bluebirds, sooty grouses you get to hear. One of my favorites, I'm actually not that good a birder, uh, but I didn't even know this bird existed until this past summer, a gray-tailed towhee. It's just like, it looks like a, a cartoon or Dr. Seuss. Um, another animal I actually do survey regularly for and observe is the Yosemite toad. Uh, you know, it's the only place you can find them in the world is, is the Sierra. And these guys are uh, you know just incredible critters. I mean, they're right up there with the pike for intrepidness, you know, they are, uh, you know, walking over a mile over snow in the spring to, to find love, which I think is incredible. And then this is actually taken from that pike of vantage point I showed you. Uh, I usually get up to, you know, right when the pass opens or sometimes even before, and I have to hike over a lot of snow to see sort of the first pika, uh, you know, the year. But one year I was sitting up there and I'm like, what's that crossing the lake? I'm like, oh, it's a bear. A bear wants to pika watch with me. 
Um, another animal I've been, uh, this has just been the past few years surveying for is I, I'm fascinated with alpine butterflies. And, uh, and so it's been really incredible. I just gave a talk on alpine butterflies. If any of you are interested, I can send you the link because they are uh, just beautiful creatures. And again, I love that these little dainty things can fly over passes at 12,000 feet and survive. Um, Alpine chipmunks, uh, when you're pica watching, you get to see a lot of chipmunks. If you didn't know it, the Sierra is the hotbed of chipmunk diversity. I, I forget the exact number of species and there's some debate, but I think we have up to a dozen <laughs> in the area. It's pretty, and they're really hard to tell apart. I can tell you that. Uh, Douglas squirrel and chicory, you get to see them a lot. And of course the yellow-bellied marmot. Uh, if I wanna come back as any animal, it is the yellow-bellied marmot. Um, unlike pikas, they do hibernate. Uh, they hibernate for a long time too. They're only out like three or four months a year. And when they are actually not hibernating, they still spend almost 90% of the time in their dens napping or napping in the sun. So they're definitely the animal you want to come back as just because they take life slow. Uh, last, this was actually taken last summer when I was pika watching, I got rewarded with Five marmot babies came out to play, which, oh, it was just so cool to see. Uh, I have not seen marmot babies a lot, so it was pretty cool to see these guys come out and just, that's one of the also, you know, people ask me, how do you get so many wildlife, incredible wildlife settings? Just be still, you know, and you'll be amazed what, you know, the wildlife will respond and come out and, and uh, you know, sort of share some space with you. Um, also, the Belden ground squirrel. I am proud to report uh, as a result of sitting still and taking pictures, uh, I am the number one observer on iNaturalist of Belden ground squirrels because they come out a lot as well when you're pica watching. So it's kind of fun. And then there are the animals that come out that I still love. However, uh, obviously might want to eat the little pica and uh, coyote is one. Uh, although pikas have some pretty good defenses against most predators except the last one, which is they are fast and they can get under rocks fast. So I haven't seen too many coyotes be successful. Uh, raptors too, they, they definitely prey on pika, but uh, as my friend Alan Fish um, of the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory says, pikers are just way too smart for raptors. You know, they have warning calls, which I'll go over and they get under uh, under rocks. These are all uh, raptors uh, I've seen at the pika site. This, this this bald eagle is really trying either to get pikers or the squirrels, but didn't come up with anything. Um, and then, but it's probably its nemesis is, is the weasel, the long-tailed weasel. And this was actually one I, I saw chasing a pika, but uh, did not end up victorious uh, running over the rocks. Um, but how I got involved in pika, I was actually hiking in the Gala Lakes region, Gata, over probably a, over a decade ago. I always knew pika, you know, were there and were aware of them, but I stopped for a moment to take a drink and this pike, I looked down at this little, I felt something, this little pika actually ran over my foot uh, on my hiking boot. And I was like, that's odd. I, I thought piker were uh, you know, a little shyer, but, and then it led me to discovery, look where did he come from? And that's where, especially the Gala Lakes area, I found like, the Gala Lakes is just prime pika habitat, at least the talus slopes around there. And pika is struggling a lot with um, a variety of issues, climate change, although it's not as sort of cut and dried as we think, but uh, Gala Lakes, uh, the, for a number of reasons, is, is pretty good ideal habitat um, for these guys. Uh, so I've been for about a decade now um, surveying pikas in a few areas around the Togo Pass area, Gala Lakes being one of them. And when I was preparing for uh, putting together a pre presentation on pika blues, I realized I garnered over 2,600 photos of these guys. And I'm not a photographer. I take photos for education, but, uh, but I was amazed to see I had accumulated that many and, and hence decided to do, uh, you know, put together a presentation to show some of the, the cool uh, experiences I had had. Uh, Rob Hirsch, who I can't say enough good things about as a photographer, he is a photographer. Um, he just uh, had a book came out called The Nature of Yosemite and, excuse me, featured an essay of mine on the pika with his photos, which are much better. Uh, and I do have to give a shout out to my mentor in this area, Dr. Eric Beaver. He is uh, an incredible scientist, has published a lot of papers and uh, He's really been great. I share my sightings with him and, and ask him lots of questions about what to, what to look for for pika and pika behavior. 
So let me get into it. What I just want to tell you about really is I'm just going to, I want to tell you about things I think you should know about pika. And first of all is, yes, they are the cutest animal on the planet. This is a pika that came out and sat with me for some time while I was watching lunch. And you could tell was very curious about me. Like, hmm, what's this person doing? Uh, but look at, look at this animal. They look like this kind of fluffy potato. Um, they just, you know, on the adorable cuteness factor, it's definitely overload. Uh, they just have these sort of mustachy face if you look closely and whiskers. Uh, this is a very young pika uh, years ago that came out uh, tiny. You know, you can tell um, once they get to a certain age, it's hard to age them, but uh, the sort of pika is of the year as I call them or whatever, or the first pika, uh, they're pretty small, so it's pretty, uh, pretty um, easy to tell the, the, the ones that were born that year. Um, another thing you should know is pika poop is actually really cute too. That's me holding some pika poop. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is actually a latrine of years and years and they will, they, their homes under the rocks, especially in winter, they have rooms, right? They have their latrine, they have their hay pile I'll get into and they use the same ones year to year. So this is quite an accumulation of pika poop. Also what's cool is pika poop helps with science. Pika will poop and repoop and you know re repoop and uh, eat their poop and until it becomes these little solid balls, which scientists can actually kind of carbon date to get an idea of what the historic length of of pika populations are in the area. Especially if like the pikas have vanished, they can sort of see where they are. But these little piles are really cute. Um, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, pika poop is cute. Another thing you should know is pikas also eat poop. Uh, this is a pika with marmot poop. And uh, yeah, again, these cute animals, it's sort of like butterflies like poop. You're like, oh, it's such a pretty animal likes to eat poop, but they sure do. Uh, and so yeah, pikas will carry fresh poop and put it in their hay piles or eat it right away. And uh, again, it's something about an adorable animal with feces in its mouth that I think is pretty funny. Uh, another thing. I want you to know about pikas after years of really like, you know, sitting there like Jane Goodall did with the gorillas and observing these guys, they got some attitude for such a small animal. Uh, they are small, but mighty. They really rule the high country. It's sort of like I have five dogs and all are over 50 pounds, except for one. And the smallest one is the one who rules my house uh, in the other dogs. But uh, here is a pika. I wish this kid photo had come out better because you don't often see, uh, you know, pika. Um, they, they live, you know, they defend their territories. So seeing them together like this was kind of cool. This pika was like, talk to the hand and get out of here. Uh, you are in my territory. Um, this is, I, I thought was a sort of the, I am not impressed uh, pika look when I was sitting there watching him. I was like, what are you doing, human? Um, I call this the pika king photo. This pika wanted me to know that this was his territory and he ruled it. Uh, and I love they sit on their little rock thrones like this and just, you know, they got self-confidence for, for such a little guy, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, if you like pika, another thing you should know if you want to see them, they are hard to see. Pika watching requires, as I said, a lot of patience and diligence. And I always tell people, don't look for pika, just look for motion. Pika are camouflage they you know they are the color of granite where they live so it's really hard to see i don't know if you've been able to spot in this photo the pika yet but there it is so it's it, it does require a lot of just sitting and looking and watching for motion and and tracking these little guys as they fly across the rocks um I often describe pika again as fluffy potatoes. They, you know, they just, especially when they start getting their winter coats, that's about what they look like. And these photos, especially, I think, really show that that description is apt. This looks like a fluffy potato with a head on it. And uh, again, can you think of a cuter animal? If you can, put them, put it in the chat. Uh, but they, uh, when they get again, when they get their their coat, and they get especially at the end of the season, they they get some body fat on them. Fluffy potato is the only way to describe them. If you want to see pika, uh, one thing you should know is I described and showed those, you know, you really want to look for some, some talus slope with sort of a, a mix of big and, and medium boulders. Um, and 
vegetation patches surrounding them so that they have places to run and see the vegetation. But the best place you can see pikas, what they tend to prefer are these sort of triangular rocks that slope up like this. That way they can sort of, you know, have be watched on sort of that sort of corner of the, of the triangle up slope and they get a great vantage point. They like the sun and then they can back off and conceal themselves pretty quickly if they see something. So look for sort of what I call the pica thrones, these sort of triangular rocks that they will be resting on to sort of take in the sun, but also survey the territory. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the best ways to sort of, you know, if you're at a talus slope, sort of focusing on those shaped or angled rocks is a good tip for a pika sighting because you'll see them a lot. And again, it, if they're not moving, it takes a lot to see one uh, just because they, as you can see, they blend in really well with the rocks. But this is what I call the pika nature thrones. And then again, look for motion. This, I got lucky with this shot. Uh, this, this is a pika flying over the rocks, but they are fast. I mean, these guys are hard to get shots of in motion because they are just sailing over the rocks like this. Um, food, what do pika eat, we guess a lot. Well, they eat a lot of vegetation um, and poop, as I told you. Um, there was a study about them uh, actually eating some bird brains of, of dead birds that would fall into the rocks. So they will uh, munch on protein, but for the most part, these guys really are, are omnivores, I mean, are, are herbivores and uh, after vegetation. So there's two things. One, they will immediately eat vegetation, but they also is, uh, don't hibernate. Uh, again, this intrepid little animal uh, ekes out the whole winter at 12, even 13,000 feet uh, awake. They live under the rocks, insulated by the snow, but what they eat is they will gather vegetation, like this pika is here, and then lay it, and I'll show you some pictures, in the sun to dry like hay piles. And then that's their pantry over the, over the uh, winter, which is pretty cool. So these pika are busy. You can see they're gathering different types of vegetation as they fly over the rocks. Makes it, it you know, it, it just even adds to their cuteness. Um, they even stop to smell the, the flowers, as I like to say, or they'll be munching on, you know, the vegetation as well. They're very busy, you know, making these hay piles. They spend the whole summer both eating and accumulating their hay piles so that they have a good winter pantry to, to seek uh, from. This is also another good tip for sighting pica. Obviously, when they're holding green in their mulls, it's a little easier to track their movements. Uh, this one was just stuffing his face with with uh, with grass. I thought was pretty funny. Uh, here's a, just a cute shot of a pika munching on a leaf, uh, and you can see that you know they eat a variety of vegetation, and this is what their hay piles result in. And pika have very different hay piles, whether it be taste, you know, maybe some of them like different vegetation or location. Some of them will have access to different vegetation more than others. And you can see the differences in the hay piles here. But what's fascinating to me about these hay piles, this is how amazing this animal is. It is layered very purposely. This isn't just willy nilly. A lot of these plants have toxins that if they ate them too early, you could interrupt their digestion probably, or you know, not make them feel well at best and maybe even you know, prove lethal at, at worst. But they layer them so that the, the plants that do have these these chemicals that could make them sick if they ate it too soon are the ones, you know, it timed it perfectly for when they would hit that hay pile layer uh, during the winter. So that's pretty savvy little guy setting up their pantry like that. Uh, you can see these are just shots of different hay piles. Again, this is another great tip. If you are uh, around talus slopes and you see these piles of vegetation, you know that a pika is around. And if you just stop for a while and, and sit, and that pika will probably come out. Here's just, again, some more views of these pretty cool hay piles. You can see the variety. That's what I love. You know, the, again, these pikas, much like I you know, don't like certain things, I'm sure pikas have uh, preference for some of their uh, you know, different foods. Uh, another thing I like to point out about pika, they have the cutest little butts. 
these are like pajama bottom feet and these little butts. It's another thing is you cannot tell the sex of a pica without picking it up and opening the little flap there. There's actually a name for it. I won't bother you with technically, but so uh, when I, I actually do name the pica, but it's a lot like uh, hurricanes. I alternate between male and female because I'm not picking these pica up and opening their flap, uh, but they have the cutest unisex butts. Um, and uh, the, like I said, those little pajama bottom feet really crack me up. Uh, now, pika are not rodents. They are actually lagomorphs. So they are uh, more related to bunnies. I like to point that out to people. And you can sort of kind of see the bunny-ness in their, their little butts without maybe the cotton tail, right? But yeah, just like, I, I, I never tire of um, showing pika butts, right? Um, so, uh, let me, so I'm gonna talk about two pica that um, I have surveyed the past two years. Now, pica you are tough to tell apart sometimes, uh, well, actually most of the time, but they have very distinct territories that they defend. They live alone mm -hmm. uh, and, unless they are, you know, come together to mate or they have young, but for the most part, they are solitary and defend their territories. So there's two pretty distinct territories that uh, I've been able to, um, I'm pretty sure, and in photo comparisons, um, know that this is the same individual over two years, if not more. Uh, they can live three, five, you know, just depending on predation, even more up to seven, maybe is probably pushing it. Um, one thing I am trying to do, and this was at the tip of another scientist, you can actually, uh, uh, some scientists will ID like big cats, like tigers by whisker patterns. The whisker pattern is actually distinct, but I'd need a much better camera to get that level of detail. So for now, I sort of have to make some guesses, but I'm pretty sure this is the same individual every year. This is, um, this uh, Sophie lives at the Gaylor Lake site. And if I can play this, this is just some video of her saying hello. She will move in. There she goes. You can see how quick they move. And again, this is a picture of, uh, again, this is right, the tail of slope right near Gaylor Lakes. Here is a photo of her in 2020 and 2019. Uh, she's, again, just a really cute little guy. I don't know. We're getting some feedback all of a sudden. I'm not sure why. Mute and unmute. Did that help? Okay. Uh, she is very, now, Pika have personalities, and, you know, all animals do. I, uh, you know, I, mountain lions I work with, I think we tend to group animal, you know, wild animals in groups and they just are on instinct. No, they are individuals. They have individual personalities, just like our dogs and cats that we have in our home do. And she was a very friendly, inquisitive pika. She would always come out when I was there. I think she got used to seeing the blonde girl sit there and she'd bring her lunch and eat. She, she was very social little pika. Uh, let's see. Uh, these are just some photos from her. Most of these are taken last year. You can see she she had no problem posing for the camera. And this is uh, Sophie's hay pile both years. And you can see very similar. You know, she's got a style on her hay pile that uh, tracked uh, for both years pretty consistently. Here's a close up and you can almost see she actually has some marmot poop in there. So Sophie definitely likes some marmot poop. So Sophie's a pretty cool pika that's sociable. This is another pika that's not at the Gala Lake site. It's a, another site that I look at at Toga Pass, and his name is Petey. So let me play a little video of Petey. There he is, given the pika chirp. So these pika calls are pretty fascinating. They have a lot of different calls. That one was like, hey, who are you? This is my territory. Just want to tell you that. Um, they actually are really cooperative and um, will send alarm calls, which is a little different across the landscape to warn about predators. And what's even more interesting to me is you have the cooperative spirit around animals at these sites, the other, like, you know, whether it be the chipmunks or the, the marmots, that they will cooperate and give warnings about predators across species. And you'll see it in action. It's pretty cool to see. Um, I actually saw once at the Pika site a marmot stand up to a coyote and actually chase the coyote away, which I was really surprised. I wish I had gotten that on video. Um, this is Petey's home, a little different than where uh, Sophie lives, different vegetation a little bit. And here's two photos of Petey, uh, 2019 and 2020. 
So he definitely put on some, some weight and is now a little more potato-y as I like to call it. He is, PD is not as social. He'll come out right away to establish his boundary and tell you, this is my site. And then he'll sort of go back in and I'll sit there and he'll come out and go back in, come out and go back in. Whereas Sophie will just sort of, you know, come out and really like sit for a while and like share some space. Um, here is PD with, I love this look. Hey, it's you again. Okay, great. Uh, and here's Petey's hay pile. And again, contrast this with Sophie. Uh, he's got a lot more grassy vegetation or surrounding him than Sophie does. So you can see the difference in style and what they're uh, putting there. Here's a, just a close up of one of his hay piles. And they'll have multiple hay piles. They, they may, you know, it's not just one. So one of uh, this past summer, I was out looking for PD and he wasn't coming out, wasn't coming out. I was with a friend of mine. I'm like, this is weird. He usually at least comes out to sort of check us out. And we were there for a while. And all of a sudden I see running across the rocks, a long tail weasel. I'm like, oh, well, no wonder PD hasn't come out. I wouldn't come out either. And I've seen weasels at the Pika site before, but they're always so quick. I haven't been able to get photos of them. So this was pretty cool to actually see and be able to get some photos of their, their nemesis. Um, it well, did have a happy ending, at least for the pika, maybe not for the weasel, but um, about 15 minutes after this weasel ran up the ridge and over to the next, uh, Petey comes sprinting down from wherever he was hiding back to his, his um, little territory. So it was a happy ending for uh, for PD there, but, uh, and he did uh, my last pika survey before the, the pass closed again, both Sophie and, and PD were doing alive and well. Um, Petey though is a pooper. I, and he, so Sophie's poops, she pretty much hides. Uh, they are sort of under rocks. You have to look for them, but no, Petey, he wants you to know these are all out. You can see them. Uh, he's, he's definitely someone who wants to show his, his poop. Um, I'm going to skip that. This is, um, so, so yeah, P, Petey, uh, just very different from Sophie. And it's really fun to see their, their different personalities. So um, this is a, um, a, an excerpt from the most recent book I just had released, which is actually more of a guided activity journal for kids and adults around connecting or reconnecting us to wildlife and what they, they mean to us. Uh, there's a section on pika in both my books. When Mountain Lions or Neighbors is, is more a traditional book that looks at, at wildlife across California. Uh, the pika is in there as well. But this one I always like to end with, like, I do feel a real personal connection with the pika. And I, you know, a spirit animal means a lot of things. To me, it's just an animal that I, I take inspiration from. And I ask people to think about what their spirit animal is. But I, I like to talk about this, especially these days, because obviously we've just lived through what, you know, is probably the most challenging year of most of our lives. And I tend to think of the pika in the challenges they have to face, living on dried grass at 13,000 feet in, you know, some of the harshest conditions on the planet, and they make it. Uh, so I, I tend to look at them for if they can, if they can make it through life under those conditions, I can make it through this pandemic. So again, they are just such an incredible animal. So here is my uh, contact information. And I think we have some time for questions now. Uh, let me move the chat thing. Uh, if people have questions or not, let me take that down so we can all see each other. Dun, dun, dun. More easily. But yeah, Alexis, uh, did you moderate or do I moderate? You let me know, either works for me. People can either, I, I think, ask them uh, on video or can type them in their, um, in their, in the chat room. Yeah, we already had a, a question while you were doing the presentation from Lindsay who asked if pika move their hay piles under, I assume, rocks when it starts to snow. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so, and I should get a definite answer. I bet Dr. Eric Beaver could answer, but what I observe is um, obviously you saw like some of those hay piles are pretty exposed. So, you know, a layer of snow, they, you know, uh, may not be the best. So I think, you know, once it's sun and dried, they might move some, but I think that big a hay pile too, they just rely on the snow pack to insulate, which actually, you know, wouldn't make that, you um, hay pile get as wet as you would think. Uh, and that's one of the reasons like with 
climate change and less, you know, there's a lot going on with PICA with climate change. You know, the, the sort of original philosophy was they, they don't like the heat. Um, so as it gets hotter and hotter, they wouldn't be able to say, you know, survive that heat and they'd move up slope almost until, you know, they ran out of room and sort of the Jacob's ladder to heaven uh, that they they'd and they'd all disappear. Uh, listen, climate change is impacting them, but it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, it's not just the heat, and some of them can switch hit to survive. But snowpack is really key because although they don't like the heat, they're not going to survive a winter exposed to the elements. And that snowpack covering them in their hay piles is so key. So when you start talking about no snowpack or low snowpack, that's going to impact them in a lot of ways, as well as um, quality of vegetation. You know, if you don't have as much snowpack to feed uh, good quality vegetation, that vegetation that they do collect is not going to be as good. So anyway, uh, you know, long answer to your question that, yeah, I think they do move some hay piles on the other hand, like that big hay pile like that, I'm guessing they don't. They just rely on the snowpack to cover it. Thank you. We have uh, another couple questions in the chat and I can read out ones in the chat and people can also unmute themselves if they'd like to ask out loud. Um, but we have a question from Mark uh, asking, do we know the lowest elevation pika live in the Sierra Nevada? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so with climate change, they've definitely been moving upslope there. You know, that is a trend when uh, Grinnell did his survey in the uh, early 1900s, I think they were finding them as low as like six or seven. They were definitely at lower elevations. Um, I hardly see them below nine or 10. I mean, I've just um, not, I've heard reports of, you know, somebody saying they've seen them at seven. I, you know, nothing confirmed. Um, but for the most part, you're seeing them at, you know, 9,000, 10,000 feet, you know, nothing below that at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, I would love, I, I think the scientists would be very interested to hear from you if you are seeing them that low. I don't doubt they're there. It's just they're not as widespread as they used to be. Um, Dr. Eric Beaver, as I told you, surveyed sites. He works mainly in the sort of um, a little nor north of Yosemite. Um, you have Rob Killinger also doing work. Um, a lot of the historic sites of those lower elevations um, definitely have been abandoned. But, you know, I think the thing about this too is, is that not all sites are equal, right? So when you have um, the changes like we're seeing with climate change, there are some adaptation strategies pika can use, such as they're observing pika foraging at night. Um, or like the Gala Lake site is really interesting to me because I think the climate hasn't that one, there's just such great sight. You have plenty of water with the lake. You have plenty of vegetation, right? There's just, you know, that one is just such an ideal sight. So, so I think again, the the answer is it's complicated, and you may have some lower elevation pika that because of the the microclimate at the site, right? The, not all these sites are equal. Um, they might be able to uh, to switch to an adaptation strategy a little better than some of the other uh, pikas that you you know some of the other sites that you see. So, like I said, it's complicated. I don't doubt there's lower elevation pika, but you're just not seeing them as as commonly as the the ones at nine, ten thousand feet and above at this point. Okay, and. Uh... Also in the chat, Christy asked, are you typically seeing them from rock areas near trails or going off trail to find? Uh, both, uh, you know, there's pika sites right on the road. Uh, you know, I mean, I, both in the Rocky Mountains and, and, and Yosemite. So I think, you know, that the, if you want to, and then there's sites I do that are off trail. I'll tell you the off trail pika are shyer. They are not used to people. Um, there's a, uh, the two Gaylor Lake sites that I showed you, the one that's right, that, that Gaylor Lake site um, that Sophie lives at, she's right off the trail. I mean, they're used to seeing people go by all day. Um, another pika site in the Gaylor Lake Basin I look at is off trail. You're almost never seeing people there. Those pika don't come out as much when I'm out there. And I try to be sensitive to that and not spend as much time up there, although I think they're getting used to me now. Um, so uh, you can see them both, you know, off the road, off trail, uh, or, you know, right alongside the trail. They, they tend to, you know, they're adapting to human presence in whatever form. Uh, absolutely. 
Awesome. And then I think we have uh, Grace Anderson has ra you've raised your hand if you want to unmute and ask a question or comment. Uh, can you hear me? It's Grace. I think so. Uh, thanks so much, Beth. Uh, I'm with you. These are guys are beyond cute. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so few people understand that they're related to rabbits, you know, and not uh, uh, rats or some uh, rodent family. So I really enjoyed your presentation. And I did just want to share that uh, I swear I have a pika friend who comes out and talks to me <laughs> on the old Myers grade in South Lake Tahoe. And I do have uh, witnesses, uh, reputable women mm -hmm. who walk with me, uh, some of who have, have seen it over a period of, say, five years, and others who have just heard it. And I'll just mention that it, that may be an example of um, uh, human beings created uh, an environment years ago, decades ago, uh, on the Myers grade where they put these big, huge rock blocks to build um, up uh, above the road about halfway up the grade. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, creates that deep, dark, cold, cool area that somehow a pika comes from somewhere and uh, it inhabits it. And uh, uh, I don't have a dog, so I, I sometimes I walk by and, I, and, and a minute later or so, I'll hear the pika. <laughs> and I'll know that he knew I walked by. I imagine this, right? And I go back and I, I talk to him. <laughs> so uh, very magical. And there is a woman who I'm sure you know, Constance Millar, who's a researcher for the Forest Service. And uh, she lives in Mono City part time. And, and she uh, researches the, the, the Forest Service's theory that uh, indeed the pike is are not going to be pushed off the tops of the mountains by climate change, that, that they're going to uh, fool us all by finding these refugia in other you know, places, much lower elevation and even farther toward the east. And uh, I don't know what the absolute numbers show, but uh, <laughs> we have one anecdotal evidence of, of a pike at 6,500. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing, Grace. And I don't doubt, I mean, I don't doubt that, you know, Sarah, I think if there's one thing I know as a scientist, animals will do things that we can't predict and we think we know it all and we don't. And I think, again, like that issue about will they go up the mountaintop or not? Again, it's just more complicated. I think, you know, all the literature I've read, and there's a lot of debate in the pika community right now. It's kind yeah. of fun. I, I just got named in my first scientific paper, one of many co-authors, but it was so fun to, you know, to be in my first pika scientific paper. But there is a lot of debate in the pika community now. But I think one thing uh, is that at some point, there'll be a tipping point where it doesn't, you know, the adaptation for many animals is not going to be an option. And I think what that is in my mind is the less snowpack, right? So um, if you are a high elevation pika, um, you are dependent on that for many, many things. Like I said, quality of ed vegetation for uh, insulation from winters. Uh, so I think that, you know, again, that they were moving up the mountain just because of the heat um, is not, you know, the, the truth, but that climate might, cause widespread um, extinctions for pika or at least po you know populations I think that still holds up in my mind um, but there's no doubt and you know like your pika and like others I've seen they will they will switch hit as long as they can right um, and I you know I think of that you know those pika in the Columbia River Gorge uh, grace which is probably a little you know kind of similar to you it's cold there um, they are living off mosses, interestingly enough, you know, there's no snow there, there, um, but, you know, then, but, but they, their temperature, I think that's one of the things with Yosemite is you start going down slope, it gets hot quick. I live at 3000 feet and, you know, it's a hundred degrees here in the summer, right? So that's, you know, another thing that California has, that, like maybe the Rocky populations of Pika don't have that temperature differential is not as stark. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's been interesting to watch. I don't think that they're all doomed to fly up to heaven as we originally thought. And I, you know, I followed, I believed in that or thought that science uh, panned out at first too, but they're, they're definitely, they're one to watch. I still am a little bit concerned about them. So I, I think what, I think from your presentation that I could maybe begin to imagine that it's the same pika that's been at this place, say three years out of five. 
Oh yeah, sure. I mean, they live, you know, yes. without a, if they can escape predation, three, five, even seven, they uh, go on. Uh, absolutely. Yep. And I think what, been, mm -hmm. you've inspired me that if I just go sit on the big boulders somewhere nearer where I see it, that indeed maybe he'll come out instead of me just walking by. Right. So I'm going to, yeah, I would sit, sit in, you know, get a chair, you know, don't get, I, I usually, you know, give them a little space. Don't sit right on one of their rocks, but if, if you've like seen them run out or hear them, just, you know, give them some space. I, I bet it'll come out. They're, they're curious. They're, they're curious. You know, they want to see what's in their area. So I, I, I bet you'll see them if you, yeah, bring lunch. And that's what, I mean, I just eat my lunch there. I'll, you know, they just sort of like, oh, okay. Hi neighbor. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a couple more questions that came in in the chat. Uh, Luis had two questions. Uh, firstly, are pikas still extinct in the Lake Tahoe area? And secondly, are the pikas in the Ruby Mountains a different subspecies from the pikas in the Sierra? Oh, cool. So uh, I don't think pikas are extinct in the Tahoe area, but I could be wrong. Um, I don't know that area as well, but I was, I, I was on the assumption, well, that's where, um, Grace, isn't that where you're at with that 6,500? Yes, and, and I, I see and hear many, many pikas off trail in Desolation Wilderness. Okay, so you're right. I mean, they, they were saying, yeah, researchers, I was just Googling it because, yeah, it does say like Lake Tahoe's pike is gone. So, uh, again, I'm, but I, if uh, if Grace is right, apparently that's not the case. But it does make sense given you know Tahoe. You got I mean the elevation there is I'm trying to think like the highest elevation just around the lakes. You're not what's that seven like is where the sort of lake plateau if you were to access the lakes are. Well, the lake level is uh, you know mm -hmm. sixty three something sixty four. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, of course the highest point in the in the basin, the Lake Tahoe Basin, is Friel Peak, which is you know about ten thousand. Right. So yeah, I mean it would make sense at least it depending on how you're defining Lake Tahoe, those lower elevations just based on uh, the findings that I know about the Sierra, where they're not below those elevations, that would make sense. But um, yeah, I will get you know I um, again I'm not as familiar with the Pike in the Tahoe area, but I will. Uh, get back to who asked that question. Is that Lewis? Um, I will get back to you and see if that is still the case. Uh, but obviously, Grace might have something to offer there if that is indeed a pika. <laughs> um, and then the Ruby Mountains, um, I had to look up where that is too, Elko County. Uh, and again, Eric could probably answer that he does a lot of work in Nevada in the Great Basin, if that's indeed where the Ruby Mountains are. Um, and you asked if it's a different subspecies. I don't know. I know obviously the species we are looking at in, um, in the Rockies and here in, in, in the United States is the American pika. There are different species of pika around the world. Uh, some of them are adorable. Uh, there was that teddy bear pika that got released. But uh, Lewis, if you email me, I'll get an answer for you if that's a different subspecies. I, I don't know. All right, we also had uh, Victoria raised her hand if you want to unmute. Hi everybody. I actually have my pika trying to play with me right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was just curious about pika's breeding habits. Is that something like do they have a few pikas at a time and how, do, how does that work? I'm just I don't know much about they'll that. Do a, they'll do some summers if I have this right. A, 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 um, uh, they might have actually two litters uh, of pika uh, at, at a time and, you know, mainly, obviously, probably for survival strategies, right? Uh, you know, obviously, the, they are um, like bunnies. Uh, I, you know, you I have jackrabbits in my yard and brush rabbits, and I just look at them like, you're here for prey and I feel bad because, you know, and that's, that's why you do have lagomorphs, you know, breeding a lot because they are, they are there to be eaten. However, I do think the pika have uh, a, a little better uh, survival strategies than the jackrabbit in my yard who just send, tends to be out in the open a lot and relies on fleeing and doesn't have much cover. So, um, so yeah, they'll cycle through a, uh, potentially a couple 
in the in the in the um in the summer months they don't like you know bears sometimes will give birth over hibernation or you know but again pikers don't hibernate so that's not as applicable and that's the only time you know that is the time only time they will sort of come together which is to mate so yeah thank you appreciate it and i really appreciate yeah, your presentation this has been fascinating oh, thanks. And, um pika babies are adorable i you know i need i don't i don't have any photos i've taken but i should you know all the photos by the way in this presentation were um or mine um but i do need to ask a researcher for some pika baby photos because you can imagine like the little, <laughs> little baby pikas yeah Uh, my email, I'll, I'll, I'll type it in. Yeah, and I can also, if it's all right with you, include some of your contact information in the follow-up email that I send out with the Absolutely. recording. Absolutely. But I know it's two sort of graces and other people's point. This is where, you know, community science uh, uh, was uh, used to be called citizen science, but to be more inclusive, community science is really important. Uh, we just did a, I just hosted a bio blitz here in my county because we wanted to track a number of species that were having issues. One is the monarch butterfly. Uh, if you don't use iNaturalist, I really encourage you to sign up. It's uh, become really user friendly. There's a great app. Um, but if you are seeing pica in your area, you know, the scientists can't be everywhere, you know, like, um, I do a lot of butterfly surveys in my area, but I can't be everywhere. So that's one of the reasons, you know, having a bio blitz or just the more, if you're seeing pica at 6,500 feet, try to get a shot or uh, you can record a sound file is, is uh, good as well and upload that. The scientists use iNaturalist or if you don't want to use iNaturalist, uh, email, you know, find out who's doing pica studies in your area and I can help with that and email them these sightings because these really do help um, help scientists do their work and track animal movement. And I'll say that we know in the Sierra, we are experiencing a wholesale ecosystem shift up here. You know, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this call is familiar with fire. Uh, I had to evacuate the last three years, uh, or actually not last summer. The Creek Fire, though, was only 15 miles from me, but the three years before that, um, we have 100 million pine trees dead. You have, you know, climate, which is obviously impacting fires and drought and everything. And animals in this area are adapted to things like fire, but not the fire we're introducing. I don't even like to call them wildfires. It's human caused firestorms. You know, they're used to major fires cycling through in, you know, 10 years, eight years, not every year. Uh, they're not used to hundred million trees dead. So although they have adaptation strategies, uh, they're not really cut out for the, you know, some of the things us humans are introducing to them as well as increasing development. They don't have as many options. So it's really important, uh, you know, we're, I'm trying to get a handle on how wildlife's changing and just in my little neck of the woods, you know, Yosemite and the outside Yosemite, the foothills. So please, if you're seeing pica or other wildlife, um, monarch butterflies, especially use iNaturalist. It really does. Scientists do use those platforms, and your sightings could be really key to understanding some stuff. Uh, I can't, I cannot un, um, overstate the importance of of all of you helping science. And indeed, you know, we're seeing wildlife move in. Uh, we just had a wolf sighted 40 miles from my house. I am over the moon. I predicted when OR7 crossed the state line that I'd be hearing wolves howl from my deck in 10 years. I'm not going to be that far off. Uh, so um, anyway, your help, not just with pica, although if you're seeing pica in your area, please either submit it to me or join iNaturalist so that we can track it. I actually do sort of go on and for pica and other animals, look at what people are citing. Um, so please do that. It, it really is important to science. So this is Grace, and uh, you know I don't use iNaturalist. I've been uh, intimidated by it for birds, um, but this you inspire me. I will I will report when I hopefully if I see it this summer, uh, uh, I will report that. And I just want to cheer on uh, the wolf lovers. There there uh, is a, a wildlife cam that has uh, seen a wolf in uh, a play a part of Mono County. That yeah, I, that's I won't, I won't yeah, that, that's the wolf. 
that's the wolf I was talking about. He's been cited uh, 40, it's OR 93, and he's been cited um, in Monocut, which is 40, 40 miles from Yosemite, at least his last point. He could be in Yosemite right now or outside yeah. Yosemite for all we know. Uh, yeah, so, OR 93, our Sierra hero. <laughs> so, so cool. It's really a big yep. deal. It is a big deal. Yep, it really is cool. So we'll have, you know, so the, the pika will have another predator to contend with, although, you know, I don't think wolves are going to pay too much attention to the, pre to the pika. They got bigger, bigger uh, prey on there. Anything else people want to know about pika? These are great questions. Um, again, I apologize. I'm very Sierra Yosemite focused on pika. Um, I have not read as much of the research that some of you are asking about about the Tahoe Basin and other places, but I will get those answers for you. Any other questions or? Uh, Christy, do you have a question? Yeah, um, are you able to tell us any places specifically that you'd recommend going to look or is that kind of kept secret? No, I, don't, I mean, I don't keep, I don't like a lot of the off trail ones I don't, um, Sure. I'll just, but, but yeah, I mean, Gaylor Lakes, Tioga, Tioga Pass area, if you want to see pika, um, you know, again, my knowledge is mostly Yosemite. I'm sorry. If other areas, I, I don't know the pika sightings, uh, you know, the pika sites, but um, Yosemite, Yosemite is great. Where is Gala Lake though? Cause I looked it up on a map and it said Ontario, Canada. Oh no, G uh, Gaylor Lake, it's right near, the trailhead's right near Toga Pass. That's a great area to see pika. Uh, Saddlebag Lake um, near Toga Pass, another good area to see pika. Um, but really, you know, uh, any sort of, I'd say any 10, you know, 10,000, 9,000 and above, you know, you saw pictures I showed you of those talus slopes. If you look for talus slopes like that again with some vegetation around them even right off the road I'm telling you there's some sites right off the road and just sit and listen that's probably your your first you know listen uh, mornings and evenings are best uh, although I see pika activity all sorts of the day you can look for hay piles um, but yeah they're they're pretty widespread in the Sierra uh, at, at that elevation at this point so any of those uh, sort of indicators about good pika habitat is good. But yeah, Gaylor Lake, I, you know, I, I think is one of the best places to, to see them in Yosemite, definitely. Thank you. And just, yeah, and poop, you can look for poop, but listen, you will, I bet all of you have heard pika. They are loud, they're uh, distinct. And um, the, I'd say the most common um, miss sighting is people think belding ground squirrels are pika. And I hate letting people down. They'll come to me with photos of belding ground squirrels. It's like, see, I saw a pika. And belding ground squirrels have a call too. It's, it's different. And I, I feel bad saying, no, I'm sorry, that's not a pika. That's a belding ground squirrel. But, you know, the, this, you know, belding ground squirrels have tails. They're longer. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, look out for those differences, but I'd say you, it is actually not that hard to become a pika sighting expert, as I call it, you know, just those habitat characteristics, as I told you, um, look, you know, Google pika noise, and you can be become adept at what their call sounds like. It's like a meek, meek, right? Um, and I bet all of you will have much success uh, looking for pika wherever you're at, at those elevations in the Sierra. Another good place to look is um, up Lundy Canyon, um, yes. which is north of Mono City. And it has a lot of talus. And you just keep walking up there and listening, and you'll hear them. You'll hear them. And then Lynn put Glacier Canyon. Uh, actually, Lynn, yep, that is one of my pika survey sites up uh, right before you hit the Dana Plateau. Um, and then the Dana Plateau, that, the Dana Plateau is probably, I have to say, if I had to name a favorite place in the Sierra, it is the Dana Plateau. Uh, it's also, I go up uh, and do butterfly surveys on the Dana Plateau. So the pikas are a little below right before you hit the top. I, although they're up, I have sighted pikas right at the top of the Dana Plateau. Um, but um, butterfly, I actually sighted a rare butterfly on the Dana Plateau, which I was really excited about. But yep, good, good tips. Yeah, it looks like there's a couple other suggestions in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. And 
We're coming right up against one o'clock now. So I just want to say thank you so much, Beth, for presenting. This was awesome. And thank you for answering everyone's questions. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everyone who attended uh, for showing up and for participating. Uh, and also thank you to any of you who have ever donated to the Alliance for helping us put on these webinars for free. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so yeah. much. Everyone Thanks have all a great for being here. And please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, if I didn't answer your question, I will get the answer for you. And I wish you, once the snow melts or once you can get to these high elevation areas, uh, I wish you great pica sightings. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, mm -hmm. Alexis. Great, great job. Wow. Take care.